American Vision presents Meet with the Speakers. Talking about the history of the conservative movement with Dr. Gary North, and there is a video series that American Vision uh, has produced called The History of the Conservative Movement. It's 15 uh, sessions, uh, 30 minutes each, great for a, a home study, a, a homeschooling, uh, or just your, your own test and understanding of the conservative movement as well. Uh, these bite-sized uh, pieces of 30 minutes uh, with, with text up on there and as well as illustra illustrations will give you a, uh, probably you won't find a better history of the conservative movement anywhere in the United States today. Uh, Dr. North, we talked a little bit about uh, the, the, the shift that had taken, taken place and I want to and, and I'd ask you uh, off camera, I mean, 1959 was, was the movie Ben-Hur, which won 11, 11 Academy Awards, uh, really was the kind of the epitome of a, of a conservative worldview. Uh, but then something happened in 1960 with, with, with two films. What, what were they? Well, the first film was Inherit the Wind, which was the fictional attempt to reconstruct bits and pieces of the Scopes monkey trial. And the other film was Elmer Gantry, which was based on a strongly anti-Christian novel of the 1920s. Both movies were clearly not after the money because it was a major break, a real slap in the face of, the, of Christian America. The Orthodox Jew, Michael Medved, has written the book on Hollywood versus America. He also did a video on Hollywood versus religion, and I defer to him in his knowledge of the history of movies. And he used 1960 as a turning point, and he argued that clearly there was something much deeper than the quest for money. As he says in his book on Hollywood versus America, generally the PG rated films, film for film, make more money than the R rated films. And yet he said they continue to make the R rated films. He believes among the younger, secular, liberal, humanist Jews who now run Hollywood, that there's a self conscious attempt on their part to break with the traditions of the grandfathers. Now, while this is all going on, and, we've, and you can spot the transition, you, 1960, and of course a lot of things happened with, with the 1960s, you know, the arrival of the Beatles and the, the, the counterculture movement and the drug culture, new age movement, all types of things. There was, a, there was an undercurrent, the, the conservative movement uh, in, in many respects was kind of underground. A lot of people were, weren't talking about it very much. You really don't hear as much about it again until probably the mid 1970s with with the with well, of course you had Barry Goldwater early on but that was a disaster of, of, of an election until I guess Ronald Reagan is kind of kind of in the wings that's right so who were who were some of the the ideological spokesmen of the conservative movement and what were some of the major publications of the conservative movement that were working underground which gave rise to conservatives at the end of the 1970s going into the 1980s. Well there's no doubt that the the two flagships who were this which were the size of rowboats were the Freeman and National Review. They began in the mid-1950s. They slowly began to build up readers. The defining moment for the conservatives in the post-war period, I believe was in 1948, which was the great national uproar over Alger Hiss, a high government official and major liberal spokesman, being accused by Whitaker Chambers of being not, not only a Marxist, but as the confrontation developed, a spy a Soviet spy. And that divided the country. That was your first real division in the post-war period that clearly defined the anti-communist, conservative, Main Street, Midwestern, 
opponent of all them city slickers in New York and Washington that we didn't trust, that brought it to the forefront and that gave Richard Nixon his foothold because he was a congressman, first term congressman at the time and he basically supported Chambers' position. And Chambers was right and finally his was sent to jail for perjury on that issue. They couldn't get him on spying because it had taken place too much, too many years before. Statute of limitations had run out. The next big push was the McCarthy anti-communist period. And that was 1950 to about 1954. So the issue was anti-communism more than any other issue as the big motivating issue to, to pull people in. It began then to spread out to the economic issues and to the domestic political issues with National Review and the Freeman. By 1960 there was a brief tiny group of people who were, wanted to get publicity so they had a Goldwater for Vice President campaign. Very brief but they did make it into the floor of the Chicago Convention, Republican National Convention. Got a little bit of publicity for Barry Goldwater and that was the year of his book Conscience of a Conservative and that book sold like hotcakes. That book was a crucial book to understand what launched the conservative movement in the post-war period, the, what I would say the domestic political side of it, where people really were getting involved to get people elected. The next great event, of course, was the assassination of Kennedy. Goldwater had been lured into running because he thought he could beat Kennedy, and there's a real possibility that he could have. Kennedy was not Camelot in 63. He was the Bay of Pigs guy in 61, and, and he couldn't go public with the whole, really couldn't go public with the whole story of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So he was vulnerable, but then he got killed, and Johnson came into power and Johnson was enormously popular in that phase, rammed through all the legislation he wanted to ram through. Goldwater didn't think he could beat Johnson but had committed and so he ran. And that led for the first time to millions and millions of conservatives realizing they were not alone. They agreed with Goldwater's position. They of course lost and I think there's a lesson there. They lost and lost big. Big, huge. But at the same time, uh, really kind of did set the stage for the conservative movement with the rise of Ronald Reagan uh, in, in, in 1980 against Jimmy Carter. So I'm uh, right. telling you, tell people today, look, we were on the losing side of this really big time, uh, but there still is hope because as liberals become more and more consistent with their liberalism, the whole system begins to uh, you know, fall apart, but you, as you're famous phrase, you can't beat something with nothing. It's not enough just to be against what liberals are all about, but to uh, have, have a, 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 a program that is a, is a great substitute for it. When we come back, I want to deal with, a, we'll go back a little further uh, than, uh, than this and go back to the 1940s and a particular book called The Road to Serfdom and the importance of that book uh, even today. The History of the Conservative Movement, featuring Dr. Gary North, from the first Tea Party to the contemporary tea parties. Now available at AmericanVision.com.